Hi everyone, this is the continuation of the first video on Derek Walcott's Ruins of a Great House. The poet now continues to give the, a description of that ruined house. It seems that the original crops were limes grown in that silt that clogs the river's skirt. It means that the, the crops that the people cultivated in that uh, silt near the river was the limes because they the, the British ate limes to prevent scurvy while sailing on the ship and the dead limes mentioned earlier are now confirmed as the fruit the plantation uh, was created to produce. The silt fine soil now gathers at the river's edge. Then the imperious rakes are gone, their bright girls gone, the river flows obliterating hurt. Here the imperious uh, rakes refers to the arrogant but idle men of fashion who once strutted around the estate with their girls. So we have imperious rakes as well as their bright girls. And what happens is the river flows obliterating hurt. Here obliterating hurt means as the river flows on it seems to wipe out all thoughts of hurt. The speaker obviously feels some kind of pain as he works his way through the ruins. He knows something horrible occurred but he senses that despite the evil of the past, the present somehow heals. Now, the speaker becomes a person. That's why he uses I. I climbed a wall with a grilled iron work of exiled craftsmen protecting that great house. The speaker becomes part of the ruined landscape. He becomes active by climbing over the ironwork. This crafted protection kept wealth and privilege intact. And you know that protection uh, that comes from the craftsmen's work, you know, that had uh, in fact kept wealth and their privilege intact. And you know that also gave the owners a false sense of uh, superiority. They felt no guilt. How could, they li how could they live with marble, fine stone, big trees and profit? See, that's why the poet says that the great house from protecting that great house from guilt. Perhaps, but not from the worm's rent, not from the padded cavalry of the mouse. Nature has taken over the grill iron work. And so, it, it's incapable of stopping the worm as well as the mouse, uh, which are the two common creatures. The word rent implying that the worms, the worm takes out something from the estate and the word cavalry is military in origin as if the mice are running to uh, rescue. So the men and women who were part of the empire are gone, but the river flows now as it did when they lived and it seems to heal the wounds of the past. The, the iron wall is an elaborate one which may have helped protect the owners from any attacks of conscience, perhaps by blocking constant views of the slaves. And when a wind shook in the limes, I heard what Kipling heard, the death of a great empire the abuse of ignorance by Bible and by sword. Here the poet means the wind in the lime trees reminds the speaker of a death rattle of empire and backs this up with reference to Rudyard Kipling who was once uh, one time known as the poet of empire. Kipling as an imperialist upheld the process of colonization seeing it as the white man's burden with the Bible and the sword, the main weapons of subjugation. So the Bible as well as the sword were used as weapons of subjugation.
so when he uh, uh, um, uh, when he felt the wind shaking the limes you know he was reminded of what Rud- rudyard kipling said however the wall could not prevent the house decay decay symbolized by worms and mice the poet heard the voice of rudyard kipling as he described the decline of the empire that was built exploiting ignorant natives using military and religious authority when the speaker walks on he reaches close to or an own uh, on a green lawn with low walls thinking all the time about the situation he finds himself in now the speaker thinks of three people three examples of english explorers as well as naval men known as sea dogs two of whom hawkins and drake were definitely involved in the slave trade see hawkins as well as walter raleigh and drake the speaker sees them as murderers and poets raleigh was certainly a poet but the but the other two were not now the poet has a sense of confusion as to how a nation could produce both criminals and writers the world's green age then was rotting line the world's green age may be a reference to the heydays of the british colonization and that was rotting lime now here this is a symbolic the the stench of limes becomes a metonym for all the horrid deeds perpetrated by the british their system fueled by the slave trade their heroes villains their galleons writing the death warrants of the countless african slaves so that stench became the charnel galleons text that here Uh, their galleons writing the death warrants of countless african slaves the road reminds with us the men are gone it's a very simple line which means men come and go but the rotten things they do remain now but as dead ash is lifted in a wind that fans the blackening ember of the mind means when the wind disperses the ash that fanned the blackening ember of his mind the speaker is reminded of the prose work written by dun see my eyes burn from the ashen prose of dun a blaze with rage i thought so he was reminded of the prose written by john dun the great metaphysical poet so looking at the landscape of the estate the speaker was reminded of various british explorers poets who were the first british colonialists and whose talents as writers make their involvements in the murderous abuse of colonized people that seem uh, particularly paradoxical the spring time of colonialism was also like a rotting line stinking like the stink of deadly slave ships the slave holders and colonialists are gone but their rotten deeds remain with us however just as ash is blown away from a fire stirred by winds so the speaker felt renewed pain when he recalled the writings of john dun the great english author so when he reminded of john dun the thought that came to him his mind was that of a slave that is a uh, a slave who is rotting in this manorial lake and the speaker is angry as he pictures a slave in the lake and so he says that he was ablaze with rage but still the call of my compassion fought that albion too was once a colony like ours part of the continent piece of the main here in spite of the horrid deeds committed by the colonial power the british you know the poet has some sort of a compassion uh, for the british it is here still the call of my compassion fought it is here that the ambivalence of the poet comes in 
and he says that that Albion too was once a colony. Albion is an ancient name for Great Britain, invaded many times over the centuries, and itself was a colony of the Romans for around 450 years. So the speaker is trying to reconcile the facts of the past with his current feelings of anger for misdeeds and abuse uh, done by the British. So this is Dunn's words, see part of the continent piece of the main. Dunn's words precede those of Shakespeare. Shakespeare said, Nook shootin. See, as the speaker goes back in his mind to those far-off times when Britain and its inhabitants were likewise subject to foreign rule and disputes, they too paid a price. So, um, this is where we have this ambivalence because the Britain also were, was subjected to these kinds of a colonial onslaught from other people. So this is all part of the continuum of human uh, generations, the journey of human life. Now extremely angry, the explanation is this, extremely angry the speaker thought to himself, even though some slave is probably rotting in the lake I see before me, I need to remember that Albion, that is England, was itself a colony once, colonized by the Romans, divided into political factions. He recalls Dunn's words that no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. The speaker once again recalls words of Dunn who proclaimed that any death diminishes everyone living, just as any small loss of territory is like the loss of a friend's manner. In in the concluding three lines of the poem, the poet says, All in compassion ends so differently from what the heart arranged, as well as if a manner of thy friends. The poem's final line suggests that the speaker now feels compassion rather than anger when he looks at the ruined house and is reminded of all the deaths associated with it. Even the deaths of the masters who profited from their now dead slaves. This recognition of humanity's plight, plight comes as a surprise. Past atrocities have to be faced, abuse and death admitted, and those who misused their power brought to book. Yet, how can these wounds be fully healed when there are so many reminders of a past rotten regime in one's homeland and that is continuing somewhere else in the world right at this moment. Here we find the beauty as well as the power of the poem because the writer or the speaker makes or the poem makes the reader think about the long as well as vast history of power as well as domination and you know all kinds of uh, horrid deeds that followed, you know, as well as the abuse. All these things, uh, uh, the poet asks, uh, demands us to reflect upon on a local as well as a global scale. So, the poet brings in a very comprehensive outlook as well as perspective and makes us think of it from a very broader, uh, broader perspective and view things uh, taking into account the local context as well as the global context. So um, Derek Walcott comes to an end with a sense of, uh, with a sense of uh, compassion for the British and you know at a broader level uh, to the uh, compassion for all the colonialists because they were also once colonized by other people. So this is the uh, whole gist of the poem. Uh, thank you for listening as well as watching. Thank you.